My name is Christine Woodside and I am standing in a field in Deep River, Connecticut where I live. This is my research defense for the Masters in History at Arizona State University. Behind me stands a barn built 125 years ago. It's been falling down for a quarter of a century. It's a symbol of how farmers in America have always struggled. My research is on the rise and fall of Seabrook Farms in southern New Jersey, the world's largest vegetable farm between 1907 and the 1950s. Seabrook gave jobs to small farm workers and refugees and created an agricultural factory that distributed vegetables to the world. In 1907, in a rural, almost inaccessible part of New Jersey, Charles F. Seabrook began planning an industrial vegetable farm. He wanted to bring a scientific method of farming the vegetables that thrived in that climate. He incorporated his father's modest farm near Bridgeton and began expanding into what would become the world's largest truck farm. C. F. Seabrook recruited venture capitalist investors borrowed more money from the federal government, and hired engineers. By 1919, Seabrook Farms looked like this scale model. It had expanded to more than 1,000 acres and then tripled in size by the mid-1920s. The Seabrook factory farm could not develop a sustainable model even though it processed enormous amounts of produce a year in its heyday. My research presents the workings of Seabrook Farms, an example of industrial farming around North America. Oral histories, newspaper articles, photographs, and statistics all show an overtaxed population of workers for a company that nurtured a public image of a happy melting pot of nationalities. Seabrook Farms and the township it built could not continue operating unless workers were exploited. Seabrook Farms used prisoners, refugees, and migrants and still could not sustain itself because it required an external flow of cash to keep the large-scale operation going. Seabrook Farms expanded and innovated in two distinct phases. The first was between 1907 and 1923. C. F. Seabrook and his father, A. P. Seabrook, began farming together. The first year they experimented with overhead irrigation and cleared $11,000 on lettuce and other crops. In 1923, investors ended support of the early phase of Seabrook Farms, which grandson John Seabrook, the writer, called basically a stock promotion based on the idea of an industrialized farm. But in 1930, Seabrook bought back the farm and a cannery, and he began experiments with freezing lima beans and other vegetables with inventor Clarence Birdseye. Seabrook produced two-thirds of the frozen vegetables sold in the United States, but then it formed its own line of frozen foods. This 1936 photo by Edwin Roskam celebrated the mechanical prowess of Seabrook Farms and the description of it on the Library of Congress site is that Seabrook was growing such truck crops as beans and peas almost entirely by mechanical means for its own large cannery for rapid freezing and lots for the market of Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington. But those innovations required field workers and factory laborers. C. F. Seabrook constantly sought new populations of migrants and immigrants willing to work around the rush of harvests and the lulls of the off-season. They bust in new groups of workers from transportation hubs to Seabrook Farms. In 1934, after wages were reduced to 18 cents an hour from 30 cents, workers at Seabrook went on strike. They tried to unionize as part of a meatpacking union, 
but it turned out they lacked government support and collective bargaining. Strike breakers included these men from Bridgeton who were sent in to guard equipment. Working conditions at Seabrook Farms were crowded and busy. In many ways, the farm resembled an urban factory. Oral histories from employees who worked and lived at the farm reveal that although they appreciated the jobs, they worked very long shifts in uncomfortable conditions for low wages. Refugee Fuzai Kazeoka remembered in an essay, our arrival in Seabrook was not a day to celebrate. We arrived to find we were to live in gray shacks. Housing manager Alan Palmer reported that, that working conditions in 1946 were, quote, chaos at that time because there were three shifts that went 24 hours a day. This paper began as a project for urban history under Professor Mark Thibault. Professor Thibault asked me to look at how farms and cities changed their interactions as suburban development ate up farms closer to the cities. When it came time to revise the paper for the capstone, Professor Peter Van Cleve helped me to hone my argument. My farm to city focus is still in the paper, but it is no longer front and center. He suggested I remove the dual focus, emphasize the industrial farm's economic sustainability, include sections on frozen food innovation with Clarence Birdseye, and add a historiography section that would place Seabrook Farms in context with large industrial farms in the West. A colleague introduced me to New Yorker journalist John Seabrook. What a boon. He took me down to Seabrook Farms area in November 2018, where we spent a whole day together. This picture shows him in front of his grandfather's grave. I also relied on some of John's previous writing about his family, especially The Spinach King, the 1995 New Yorker piece. The Seabrook Educational and Cultural Center collected oral histories of former Seabrook employees. These were very helpful in my research, especially this one by Alan Palmer, the former housing manager, who confessed that he was overwhelmed by the scale of Seabrook Farms. I have been limited by what I don't know about the many small-time farmers who worked in the same area as Seabrook, like my great-great-grandmother, who is third from the left in this photo. My ancestors farmed in the area of Greenwich, New Jersey, which was 12 and a half miles south of Seabrook. And here's my grandfather, who is the teenager in the back row of this photo at Tyler Farm. One of several farms the Woodside family rented in the early 1900s. Had my grandfather stayed, he might have worked at Seabrook Farms. I located the Tyler Farmhouse on a research trip to the area a few years ago. The experience of many small-time farmers in southern New Jersey remains somewhat mysterious. It was a hard life. The Dollar Weekly recorded farm and produce sales and the occasional tragedy. One of the motivations for my coming to ASU to study history was this story about Seabrook Farms and my family in South Jersey. I would like to write a book about this, and my research at ASU has helped me get started. For almost 70 years, while most farms expanded to industrial size, Seabrook Farms grew to a huge size. It thrived, it sold out, and it closed. Seabrook Farms may have tried to do too much. 
to lead with innovations, to be the benevolent employer, to make a profit, and to maintain that large infrastructure. Seabrook Farms changed the farming industry of New Jersey and the landscape. Its frozen food changed how Americans eat, yet it could not sustain that level of production. Its demise showed that industrial scale farming succeeds for a few people at the top, and it does so on the backs of the low paid farm workers.